Hey, thanks for coming by and checking out Pete's Snake Bite Kit again. So, as you know, if you've been here before, we're talking about building a cobra, specifically Pete's Cobra, but some other related stuff. I just finished the uh, mini series on cobras and the top eight manufacturers and so on. So we cover a lot of stuff in there. What we're gonna talk about today is what tools do you need, a little bit about fabrication and special tools and things like that. So stay with me, let's take a look. So I've been asked by a lot of people online and people I know in person, you know, what does it really take to be able to do this? You know, I was never a technician. I'm not a super mechanic or any of those things. And I really believe that with just a little bit of, of aptitude for that kind of thing, automotive knowledge, or really even more importantly than that, I think a good project-based mind. What I mean by that is if you are used to uh, getting facts and figures and parts together and making stuff happen, I really believe you could build a Cobra or any car that, that you're interested in building. Now, I'm going to talk today about some special tools that I got and how they helped and some techniques I've uh, figured out to do that, that have helped me along the way. So let's take a closer look at this. Probably one of the things that you'll underestimate is how much space it takes to do something like this. There, there's no way you could do this in a one-car garage. I mean, I suppose it's possible, but you would have to be pretty creative. So, you know, I'm in a three-car garage and, you know, my wife's car is parked over there. I've got the body sitting in the middle and this works for now, but obviously I'm working around a lot of stuff. You need counter space. Uh, this was my toolbox from when I was in the trade, which was, you know, 30 years ago was a good sized box. Now it's a shrimpy box, but I found a deal on this one at uh, Lowe's, I believe. And so I've got a little more counter space, some room for some more tools. I uh, built this workbench here to have some more counter space and storage space. And about an eight foot table there. So I've got, you know, some work area and storage area and so on. So, you know, it takes up a lot of space. You got to stay organized on this. At least uh, that's what I'm trying to do. But space is probably the number one thing that I think it's easy to underestimate what you need. So as we talk about this, I'm going to show you some of the special tools I've got and I, I've been using that have been very helpful. Uh, one of the biggest things I've found are very useful is don't be afraid to throw stuff away. I'm going to talk about how to kind of figure out how to use your tubing bender. Uh, I went through a learning curve on that. Don't be shy about throwing some tubing away. Trust me on that one. Tubing benders. So I've got two of these. This one goes from three eighths inch down to quarter inch. I gave Eastwood a little bit of flack on this because they said this would work fine for 3 sixteenths. No, it doesn't. It did kink line, but it works well on, you know, the uh, fuel line I was doing in 3 inch. I bought this one for 3 sixteenths. It works very well. When you start bending, you know, you'll see that you've got what I call a break point. So there's a break point. That's where it starts bending. And then you want to figure out, you know, from your break point, how wide is your radius? It's different on every bender. Figure that out. It'll make all your clearances more successful. I'll show you on the car how that worked out and what I mean. But get a good tubing bender. Get used to it. Don't be afraid of bending some lines and throwing them away. In fact, buy extra because you will ruin some and you will need some practice. Okay, you're going to need to cut and flare some lines. I bought this tubing bender online. It's OTC. It may have been $80. I don't remember. It wasn't a lot. And it, it's a nice set. It seems to work pretty well. One thing I'll say at the very beginning is when you hit make the bubble flare, it has a stud that sticks down into the line to keep it centered. I'm, of course, doing 316s. So I've broken two of these already. It came with an extra one. Buy some extras. I'm actually stalled on the project right now. I'll show you where I'm stalled at in a minute. And uh, you're gonna need them. You can get them from Summit or a lot of places and they're not very much money, but that one's so small that they do break sometimes. You put the line in here and it, it pushes down on the line. It bubbles it out. Then you hit it with this cone, which puts that nice flare in it. And then you're good to go. This will take some practice. So use uh, a, some disposable line at first because you're gonna throw some away. Trust me on that one. And get the technique down right and then do one that you spent two hours bending. 
Okay, something I use, it's obviously optional. Uh, when you're putting a self-tapping screw in, we've all done it, you know, you drill and it's a self-tapper and it goes in and it holds and they usually work. I've had a lot of those strip out in cars I've worked on over my lifetime. Uh, thread setter kit, they're also called nut certs. I got this one at Napa. And the way these work, it's kind of like putting a rivet in that have threads on it. So this thing goes in here. This is the nut cert. I call them nut certs. When this is threaded on here, you get this all dialed in so it's hitting and pinching this. And so as it tries to pull the thread in, it bubbles that out against the hole that you've drilled. And these things are locked in. It's much more permanent than a self-tapping screw. And they look kind of cool. I'll show you those in just a minute. Before I start drilling the hole, I cover it with blue tape so it doesn't mess up the finish on the frame, whether it's painted or powder coated like mine. Then when you're done drilling, you can just peel it off and you've got a nice clean hole there. Then once you've got the hole drilled, what we can do there is, you can see this looks like a rivet gun. We just go ahead and put the rivet in, pinch it, it takes quite a bit of clamping force, pinch that in, and then once that's in good and solid, you've got a permanent threaded hole. The fuel tank, the way it came from Hurricane, did not have a hole for the fuel pump, and I was putting a Holly sniper unit in it, as you know. They did drill it and put the holes and the screws in for the fuel level sending unit. So I just got a hole saw, three and a quarter inch, cut that to size. Just wanted to give you a warning. That is a sharp, sharp edge after you hole saw something out. Look at the edges on that puck. So that hole would slice you open and you've got to, you know, wash this out. So you want to make sure you get those edges nice and smooth so you don't have any issues. Uh, you know, after you cut it, you've got to get the tank cleaned out, however you're going to wash it out. Then you cut the pieces on the Holly pump to uh, height so it'll sit, you know, the distance off the floor it's supposed to and drop it in there. You are, of course, going to need a vise. Uh, I got some soft jaws and these have got grooves in them here and then you can put it back in this way where they're flat. I was surprised at how many times I've used these, so they're not a lot of money, obviously. Get yourself a set of soft jaws for your vise. Uh, if you're like me, you may be space challenged, and so I figured out a way to take this vise, and I can just take the nut off the back here, pull this out, and I've got more workspace. So that's something I did in my... Okay, we'll look at the driver's side first, starting back at the pump. On the driver's side is the fuel pressure side. If you look down through there, you can see the brake line as it goes over the pumpkin. And then it drops down there to the frame, across there with the fuel filter. Don't say it's a GM filter, I already know that. And here we go up to the pressure line. On the passenger side, the return line is what comes down the passenger side. There you can see it going over the pumpkin. You can see the battery cables. And we've got everything tied down there to the frame. And there we go to the EFI. And there I've got my ground right to the bell housing. All right, so let's do a recap on what's needed to pull off a project like this. Like I mentioned, you're gonna need some working space. I think you need at least two car garage area. You need countertop space, workbench area. It's really frustrating for me when I'm working on something and I've got to put everything away because I'm changing projects or I have so much stuff on the bench that I just move a little bit, stuff falls off the end. So extra bench space is nice. Of course, you've got to have a vise. I've done it, you've probably done it. Do not hold stuff with pliers or God forbid your bare hands. Bad things happen, vices are there for a reason. 
uh, you're gonna need a bin tube, you're gonna need a flare tube and so on. So make sure you buy some quality tools and practice with them because it does take some technique. Have some extra material there. I can guarantee you're gonna throw some away. If you already have extra, it won't be a big deal. It'll be part of the learning curve. All right, also, you need a floor jack. I think most do-it-yoursselfer guys have one of those. Uh, engine hoist, it's really nice to have one here instead of going to rent one every time you're pulling the thing in and out. Uh, and it pays for itself pretty quickly. Uh, engine stand, you know, I built the engine I've got. Of course, I needed that. If you're buying a crate engine, that may not be a big deal because you're mostly just, you know, plugging the thing in. Uh, Jack stands, a viewer, uh, said, hey, you need soft tops on those. And, and I went and got them that day. Thanks for saying something on that. But you, know, you don't want to scratch the finish on the, the frame. Also, an air compressor. There is no substitute for compressed air. You know, most of us are using electric tools now. I mean, I've hardly used an air tool on this since I've been working on it. But when you need to blow a line out, there is no substitute for 100 or 150 pounds of pressure to really get those lines clean. On the brake lines, on the fuel lines, they're all coming off the car before I put it together for final. And I'm gonna run air pressure through it both ways to make sure all that debris out. We don't want any of that stuff in there. So there's kind of what we need. So it's not just the basic tools. You'll need some extra stuff, but it's all doable. All right, thank you for watching. I hope you found this informative. If you're gonna go ahead on a project, I'm hoping it gives you a better idea of the things that you're gonna need beyond the basic hand tools. So anyway, Pete's snake bike kit, I'll be back. We're gonna do more stuff on this car. We're gonna get it running pretty soon. I'm hoping to make some noise with this thing in just uh, the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Please like, subscribe, send me comments, all of that stuff. That's what really makes this fun to do. Be safe out there, and I will see you on the next one.